Donald Trump called him tough. Rush Limbaugh read one of his articles live on his radio show. Ann Coulter tweeted that article to her one and a half million followers and declared, every sentence is perfect. Ladies and gentlemen, your host, former chief editor of the Jewish Press, Elliot Resnick. Welcome to the Elliot Resnick Show, where we interview fighters and firebrands on the political and cultural battlefields. Perhaps no place in America is more hostile to Zionism than a university campus. For more than two decades now, proud Jews on campus have been surrounded by aggressive professors and activists who call for Israel's destruction and accuse Israeli leaders of genocide. This past July, a couple of professors decided they couldn't remain silent. They formed the Jewish Studies Zionist Network and issued a mission statement that has now been signed by 175 academics. This statement commits them, among other things, to, quote, thwart efforts to demonize Zionism and Israel, to foster scholarship that gives voice to multiple approaches and perspectives, and to ensure that a safe space exists on college campuses for Jewish students and faculty to express their identities as Jewish Zionists in public. Adam Fuller, a professor of politics and international relations at Youngstown University, and one of four members of the Jewish Studies Zionist Network's coordinating committee, joins us now to discuss the still relatively new organization. Professor Fuller, before I ask you about the organization and anti-Zionism activity on campus, I have to ask you, you'll excuse me, about the use of the term safe space in your mission statement. I don't mean to make fun, but couldn't the authors of this statement use a more normal expression, for lack of a better word? Well, it is an interesting choice of words. Uh, You have to also remember that a lot of our signatories are people that are on the left that do believe that safe spaces need to exist. Also, the the term safe space is not necessarily a word that should just be taken by the left. I I think we could co-opt it as well. I mean, the the universities should be, uh, to some degree, a safe space in the sense that you should have the the freedom to express your own beliefs and not have any repercussions or feel at all persecuted or shut down simply because you are offering your own perspectives on things. Right. I understand what the term means. Like you, I don't object to what it signifies. But in general, I I object to the left's distortion of language. They take words that have very specific meanings. They make it more hazy. So the word safe is just strange. Safe usually we mean like, you know, someone attacking you or something physically. And it's really not space, it's place. So the language is really awkward. They really mean hostility-free zone or something like that. Um, Okay. We've all heard about anti-Zionism sentiment on campus in general. But often specific examples and details make phenomena much more concrete. So with that in mind, what would an average Jewish student encounter on an average university campus? They would experience a tremendous hostility towards Israel in the classroom from their faculty members. If not that, maybe just a very distorted picture, a one-sided picture. It may not even be openly hostile. It's just distorted. Uh, so anything from, from that to something more extreme like you know, what's going on at at Berkeley with the uh, Jewish free zones where they're not, several student organizations are not permitted to invite uh, Zionist speakers to their campus anymore. Or something like what's going on at, at some other universities where there's litmus tests now for faculty and for students that want to work in student government. They have to answer to the call of whether or not they are pro-Zionist or anti-Zionist. So it, it becomes uh, a problem for a lot, of, a lot of professors and for students that want to express their uh, belief in Zionism. And there's also events that are held like Apartheid Week events and uh, BDS campaigns and all kinds of other efforts to stifle uh, the dialogue on, on the Zionist side. And in some cases, there are uh, violent uh, anti-Semitic things that do occur, like bricks thrown through the well windows and things like that. It does happen. It's, I would not say it's the norm, but it is occurring. Supposing I'm just a Jewish student, I'm not so in- interested in student activities or Zionist activity. I'm, I'm a serious student. I want to get a degree in economics, and I'm going to get my good grades. Is that possible still on a university campus, or will this anti-Israel activity even affect that type of student? You cannot avoid having to somehow face the conformity of a academic narrative on a university campus, whether it's about Zionism or it's about something else. So JSEN, our organization, we're here for this particular topic, but there's, there's orthodoxies all over 
uh, university campuses, whether it's, you know, the environmental issues or critical race theory or transgender issues, or anything related to social or racial politics, feminism, there's all kinds of issues, even economics, right? There's all kinds of narratives that, you know, uh, it's very difficult for those that don't agree to express their disagreement. Is it extremely common or somewhat common? When I was in college, I went to Yeshiva University. I, was, I took a few courses with one particular history professor. I never knew his politics. Now, someone told me they actually saw a sticker on his knapsack. This is like 20 years ago, a little bit less, saying, you know, let's leave Iraq. We don't, we don't belong in Iraq. So from that, this was the height of the anti-Bush movement. So from, from that, I, I guess I knew he was a leftist. But nothing in his classroom did he ever say anything to indicate that he was a leftist. And for me, that was like the model of what a professor is supposed to do. You teach your material, keep your politics out. How common is that still? Do you still have a lot of professors who still try to do that or they don't even bother anymore? I would like to see more of that. I, I do have colleagues that are exactly what you're describing and it's, they are the best uh, professors and their students are very lucky to uh, learn from them. I would like to think I'm one of them. But, uh, and again, I don't, I'm not in everyone's classroom. So I, in fact, I'm not really in anyone's classroom. So I'm not seeing what's, what's taking place, right? So I can't really say what's going on with my colleagues, but I can tell you that from uh, my experience in university, and uh, I spent many years as a student myself in university, as well as everything that I've heard from my students who sometimes come to me to complain uh, and as well as other stories that I've heard from outside of my university, that it is becoming a, a big problem where now uh, specific social action is being pushed rather than, you know, this kind of pedagogy that you're describing where it's about impartiality and coming to the university with the approach that what we're doing here really is emerging from Plato's cave. We're admitting that we don't know anything. We know nothing. And we're trying to experience knowledge, gain knowledge by hearing different positions and analyzing everything critically and being open-minded to the possibility that everything that we think and believe could be wrong and be willing to even be blasphemous against our most sacredly held beliefs. That's what a university is supposed to be. I would love to see us return to that kind of model for liberal education, but I don't see that happening. If anything, we're going in the other direction. Now we have situations where, you know, universities consider themselves as having some kind of social action purpose, where we as a university need to stand for something like with social justice or diversity or whatever that is. No, that's not the purpose of a university. The purpose of a university is to experience knowledge, like I just described, to emerge from that Plato's cave and admit that we don't know anything and maybe be willing to assume for a second that everything that we believe is wrong and to be willing to feel that that great discomfort. It's not supposed, like we, you asked me at the beginning of the show, it's not it's not supposed to be a safe space. And you're supposed to feel unsafe, actually. You're supposed to be uncomfortable when you're in college and hearing things that are not necessarily in your comfort zone. Getting back specifically to your organization, which deals with anti-Jewish or anti-Zionist sentiment on campus, what does your organization do, practically speaking, to combat this? Well, we have been putting out statements over the last six months to counter the statements that have been put out by the anti-Zionist Jewish studies professors. We did one on what's going on at the University of Vermont. We did one on the Berkeley situation with the student club bylaws that I talked about before. Uh, we did we, we put one out about a couple of weeks ago defending the importance of the IHRA working definition of anti-Semitism. If I can interrupt you for a second, what happened at the University of Vermont that you were responding to? Uh, there have been uh, a number of different allegations of unfair treatment against Jewish students and Jewish faculty. There has been a federal investigation by the Department of Education into this, and it's ongoing. What we did in our statement is that we came out and supported that investigation. And so that whatever is going on, we at least need to look into it. Um, also, as far as statements go, we, we just put out a, a statement. We gave out the Schmageggy of the Year Award to uh, Peter Beinart. Well-deserved. Um, 
Now, you the first organization, the first academic organization to try to combat, because I know there have been many other, or, I don't know many, there have been several other organizations that have tried to combat anti-Zionist activity on campus. Are you the first academic organization committed to doing this? There are others. For example, there is the Academic Engagement Network, which is a fantastic organization, uh, and we want to work with them. We're not a competitor with them at all. But what makes us different from AEN and other organizations that exist is that we are specifically scholars of Jewish studies or Israel studies or adjacent fields like that. AEN is open to uh, any scholar, any academic But we are specifically people that have PhDs, expertise in this specific area. And we are doing this because these statements that keep coming out by the anti-Zionists are statements that are also just experts in Jewish studies. Like We want to fight fire with fire. Like We want to show that as experts specifically in these fields, we have a completely different position on this than the anti-Zionists do. Okay. Um, 20 years ago, during the height of the Second Intifada, there was an intense anti-Israel atmosphere on many college campuses, and numerous articles appeared in the Jewish media at the time on this topic. Have matters gotten worse, better, or stayed the same since then? It's probably gotten worse. It's probably gotten considerably worse. Interesting. Yeah. Huh. It was pretty bad back then also, as far as I can recall, but... Mm-hmm. I think that's when it first started. And I was on Yeshiva University, so I've never experienced Apartheid Week directly. I don't know if you ever did, but you probably heard from your colleagues. For those who don't know, what does Apartheid Week look like or feel like on campus? Well, they usually put up like these displays on campus that accuse Israel of being uh, guilty of, of heinous apartheid crimes. And they often have these pageants or these dramatic portrayals of Jews in Israel acting like Nazis and beating up Palestinians on like, you know, trying to make it seem as if this is everyday life in Israel. And in fact, it's completely opposite of that. And they'll have these pageants like on the university square or like in some building or? They usually have it like in the main hub of the university, like somewhere that has a lot of traffic and people come by. And oftentimes they'll have all kinds of events during the apartheid week that's geared towards trying to get the passers by and students to see that that Israel is like the, the greatest uh, danger to you know, human rights in the entire world. What's your background, by the way? I have a PhD in political science in American politics and uh, political theory. But I did write my dissertation on the neoconservative movement, and I have two books on the subject. My most recent one is on the neoconservatives in Israel and why they are supportive of an American foreign policy that is tied to Israel in in many ways and trying to settle some of the facts versus fictions over that subject. Um, I, over the last several years, gained a greater interest in Israel, specifically in Israeli politics. So I teach a class at Youngstown State University on Israeli politics, and I do a model Knesset with my students where each student is assigned a different political party in Israel to represent, so they have to learn about their party. And then at the end of the semester, they all come together at this big event that even the public is invited to come and watch. Uh, They have to get together. I'm giving them ahead of time mock election results. So they have to put a coalition together, and I make it really difficult for them to, to do it. Is it very noisy and boisterous? It, it can be. Yeah, it can be. And sometimes they, they put together a completely unreasonable coalition that would never happen in real life. And sometimes they, you know, they actually put something together that, yeah, I can see it working. But it's a fun activity and allows them to actually learn about Israeli politics by learning every aspect of Israel, every religious view, every ethnic view, every political view across the spectrum, I think it works out really well. What does your average non-Jewish student at your university think about Israel? Well, you know, students will be students anywhere. Uh, you know, they, they lean left for the most part. But it's, I think, a, a balance. You know, you get, you get a lot of students, I think, mostly understand where Zionists are coming from. Right. They they may be, you know, more sympathetic to liberal Zionism right? Uh, in Israel that, you know, promotes more of a democratic character and kind of 
de-emphasizes its Jewish character. I think that's mostly where I find most of the students sitting when they learn about Israel. Sometimes, though, you get students that are completely understanding of, you know, the arguments that, you know, you see coming from the acolytes of Jabotinsky. Like, they get that, too. Some of them do. And then you get students, of course, that, that believe that it's all you know, a settler colonial project and that Israel shouldn't exist at all. So, you know, it, it's, in my university, a mixed bag. But they're getting a very unbiased explanation of Israel, right? So they're, they're going to come away with different perspectives, and that's fine with me. Isn't Ohio more Republican country these days? Yes, yes, it is. But even in the reddest of states, when you're young, when you're in your late teens, early 20s, you know, the likelihood is that you're probably going to fall left. doesn't matter what state it is. But how does that happen? Because there are teachers. Cause I listened to an interview recently with Ron DeSantis. He grew up in a conservative family, I think in Florida. Mm-hmm. He said when he got to Yale, he said that was the first time he ever heard anyone criticize America. Because in, in his circles where he grew up, you know, he didn't hear such criticism. So if these kids are growing up in red country, where are they getting their anti-Israel views? Well, maybe from their peers. You know, DeSantis grew up at a time before social media. You know, the younger generation is more uh, leftist today than they ever were before. So they're getting these messages from a lot, a lot of different places. Some of it is rebellion against their own upbringing. We're seeing that happen too. Remember the old Winston Churchill line, you know, uh, the young man who is not a liberal has no heart and the old man who isn't a conservative has no brain. I think that only works if you're uninformed. If you're informed, you shouldn't be a liberal when you're young either. But I want to ask you what listeners of the show could do practically to help your organization. But before I do, I want to ask you one last question, which is more of a critical question. So you said that you put out a statement supporting the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism. I know many Jewish organizations praise this definition. I personally find it woefully wanting and even dangerous. I actually wrote an article about this in the Jewish press in 2021. First of all, I think it's unnecessary. I think everyone knows what anti-Semitism is. But more importantly, I think it's simply inaccurate because it gives many examples of what's considered anti-Semitism. And one of its its examples states that it's anti-Semitic to accuse Jews of being more loyal to Israel or to the Jewish people's interests than to the country in which they hold citizenship. But many Jews are more loyal to Israel than their host countries. That's just a fact. And if you ask Orthodox Jews in this country, which would horrify them more, the nuclear annihilation of Israel or the nuclear annihilation of America, many, perhaps even most, would reply the nuclear annihilation of Israel would horrify them more. So why are we on the right pushing for a definition that contains, I think, at least two elements, including the one I just mentioned, which I think are are inaccurate and therefore may backfire on us ultimately? Because in as much as the IHRA working definition has a lot of problems, and I agree with you about those problems. In fact, I see others that you didn't even mention just now. I think it's the only way to fight against things like BDS or any other kind of efforts to bludgeon into silence proponents of Zionism. Any effort to do that has to be somehow labeled anti-Semitic. You know, in today's world where you gain this kind of power uh, over your own politics by by labeling something as discriminatory. And it's not even that far uh, fetched that it is discriminatory because a lot of the the motivations behind it is to silence a specific group of people over their own self-identification in terms of their own ethnic or religious beliefs over of themselves. So it's not really, I, I think, far-fetched. I, I, think, I would say, to put it this way, that the IHRA, uh, maybe 30% of it is problematic, but 70% of it is spot on. And we need it as a weapon against, the thing, against things like BDS. I sort of understand what you're saying, but I don't... <laughs> I mean, we're in this era where, let's say people on the right, we often resent when we're called racist because we know that 95, 99% of the time is not true, but they stick this label on you and then all they're doing is creating more anger and more resentment. So granted, there are many people who are really anti-Semitic and they're just hiding behind anti-Zionism or something else, but not all of them are. And it's not always the case that everything they say is anti-Semitic automatically. And if we start having these labels, and these definitions, and we say, well, you fit this definition, therefore you're anti-Semite automatically. I think it could create unnecessary resentment, which will cause more harm long-term than any gain we're going to get from this definition. 
I think that in the context in which this accusation that, that Zionism is racism, in the context in which that is used, this working definition is useful. Okay, and look, and most of the time it is true, but I'll just give one other example. It says, I think, in that definition, if you compare Israeli activities to Nazi activities, you're an anti-Semite. Yishayahu Leibovich in Israel called the Israeli soldiers Judeo-Nazis. I think it's abhorrent, but he said that. And you will find Haredim in Israel and settlers in Israel who, when they get extremely mad at the government, will call the government Nazis. Right or wrong, but the fact is they do that. So if you say, if somebody in America says, oh, the Israeli government, they're acting like Nazis. Well, first of all, everyone knows it's hyperbole. It's number one, except the far left. It's obviously hyperbole. And therefore, automatically, you're an anti-Semite if you say that what the Israeli government's doing. It, I just find that the stifling... Yeah, of- the problem with definitions is that you you lose that nuance. That is that is the problem. I, I agree. But I think inherent to the IHRA is the 3D test from Nathan Sharansky. You know, it, does this language imply demonization of Israel? Does it imply double standards that Israel has to comply with? The rest of the world does not. And does it imply delegitimation of Israel's existence? If it does those three things, then your language is anti-Semitic. Now, it doesn't actually say that in the IHRA, but that's, I think, inherent to what the IHRA is getting at, at least in most of it. Um, what can the average listener of this program do if they want to help you, your organization, fight anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism on campus? Well, first of all, if you are a scholar of Jewish studies, Israel studies, or in the adjacent fields, if you have a PhD in the subject, whether you teach in a university or not, uh, you are eligible to sign our mission statement and any of our other statements that we put out. And if you're not such a person and you know such people, you could definitely tell them about us. Promote us on your own social media. Follow us on Twitter. Follow us on Facebook and promote us and help us in that way to get the word out that we're here, that we exist, and that we are uh, speaking directly to faculty to administrations, and to academic organizations. Okay, I guess last question. What, what do you see happening in the future going forward? Things getting better, things getting worse? I think that things are getting worse. And I think that, that the need for an organization like JSEN is an indication that things are getting worse. It means, really, that we are no longer our side or this, the Zionist position is no longer the default position in the American Jewish community. Certainly not in academia and and not in the media either. And that includes mainstream media and Jewish media. Right of center Jewish media doesn't seem to see just how important the need for JSCN is because they think that we're just espousing the default position. Let's let those wacko crazy people on the far left say what they're gonna say and don't feel threatened by it. It, it's, it is a problem. No, people need, we need to wake up and realize that we're no longer the default position. Like we're, we're, in fact, if anything, we're soon becoming the minority. We may already be the minority. I don't know. Given the fact that we have, you know, so many signatories on our mission statement suggests that we're not yet, but we're, we're pretty much even between how many support us versus how many support the, uh, the anti-Zionist uh, position. You're talking about in the Jewish studies departments. In, in, in Jewish studies, yeah. Outside of the Jewish studies departments, it's far worse. You know, now you have whole departments now signing on to uh, anti-Zionist uh, statements. Like uh, there was the women's studies list back during the Gaza incident back in the spring of last year, where you had whole departments of women's studies signing on condemning Israel. They didn't even know anything about the subject. They're not. This isn't their field. Right. You mentioned the Jewish default position on Israel. I was interviewed on a conservative podcast a few weeks ago, and he asked me, how come so many Jews vote for the Democrats if the Democrats are, by and large, anti-Israel, at least the base is? I said, well, you know, the Jewish left has just as much regard for Israel as the American left has for America. So That's true. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, thank you so very much for your time, and good luck to you in combating um, anti-Israel and anti-Semitic sentiment on campus. Great. Right. Thank you very much. Great talking. All right, that does it for us. Thank you for listening. If you like the show, please subscribe and give it a nice rating. And if you'd like to receive political commentary and a weekly Dvar Torah from Shamshan Rafal Hirsch from me, you can sign up for my newsletter. Just send an email to editor at 
one vs 450com one versus 450.com. You could also subscribe through my website, one versus 450.com, where you also find all sorts of other goodies, a weekly chess puzzle, a weekly parenting column, all my books at discounted prices, links to my appearances on other podcasts, and more. Have a great night or a great day, depending on when you're listening to this episode.